Hi, this is Nicole Rivera, and you're listening to the Stop Writing Alone podcast. As I'm continuing the series of the Happy Campers Club interviews, this week I have the opportunity to share with you a writer who I've been writing with for, well, over a decade. It seems like um, it's a lot longer than I realized when we get to talking to Serviette Cola who is a writer who I first met in the Staten Island Writers Writing Group. Uh, She has joined us with the Stop Writing Alone Happy Campers Club, uh, especially last year when we were all on lockdown and there was so much more time available. But she's continued along with us this year, uh, squeezing in a time to meet and showing up for her writing while uh, being a full-time teacher in uh, special education classes. So I am honored to share with you uh, one of my good friends here locally, but also in the writing world, who who I know as Sevi, (laughs) Sevi Kolar. Um, She's a fantasy writer. She's a teacher. She's a wonderful person. And this is just a testament to one of the other great things that can happen when you stop writing alone. Uh, You grow together in your craft and get to witness it for each other as well. So uh, without uh, further ado, here is Sevi. I'm here today with Servietta Cola from uh, the Happy Stop Writing Alone Happy Campers Club. But uh, uh, Sevi, as I, I know, Servietta is Sevi, it's been with me and writing community long before Happy Campers was even a dream because she's a local Staten Islander with me here. So we were in the Staten Island Writers Group together since Sevi, when did, do you remember? I can't even remember now that I'm thinking about it when I joined the Staten Island Writers Group, if I had to put a date on that. I want to say before Alex, and this is so weird, but it's like the time period around 2007 to 2009, I want to say around then. Wow. Okay. So yeah, (laughs) that could, yeah, that could totally, wow. And now if we do math, that's a long time ago. (laughs) That's a long time ago. So so I'm, I'm curious for you, and I've been asking everybody this, what was it that made you feel like you needed writing community in the first place? What made you seek that out in, I mean, Staten Island Writers, we, we were both found on uh, meetup.com, which is that website that has all these cool communities and stuff. What made you find or, or look for Staten Island Writers? So I was looking for ways to connect with more people. I felt like my social circle had gotten very small. I felt um, like I really wasn't connecting with uh, the people nearby. And so I looked at things that I had enjoyed. I was, at this point, I was also um, dealing with depression. So I was trying to find things that I had once enjoyed. And I was trying to find people to hang out with to try to bring myself out of that depression and one of the groups that seemed that seemed the most interesting to me was this writing meetup and I think the first time I went to the writing meetup I don't think you were there yet I think it was not even so not even Sophia was in charge yet it was um, a local woman who would later on move to Brooklyn and (laughs) Yes, that was a different meetup entirely because I met that lady too. And that group closed down. Yes. I can't remember her name, but she moved to Brooklyn. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So maybe maybe she's the one from like the 2007, 2009 era. Right, right. Just maybe, okay. I just know I've been doing this for a while. I know, um, but I went a little bit with her. I wasn't going as often. I did enjoy going. Um, but I think it really changed up when Sophia started her meetup because not only were we going to kind of meet and talk about our work, but we'd also have like these events, like we would start writing, like uh, we start round robins on uh, when, when meetup used to have a forum, we, started a rap, we started a round robin on the forum where everybody was writing together and we were sharing works more, not just necessarily talking about works, but actually sharing chapters of our works. Um, we ha- would have prompt days. And I 
genuinely like had forgotten that I had enjoyed writing that much. And I think part of that enjoyment was also having an audience automatically built into it. Like, yeah, yeah. When I had done writing, when I had done writing in high school, I, one of the fun things was going and bringing it to your friends and like, look, look, look what I made and having them read it and just, and they're like, oh, when's there going to be more? And you feel so excited. And I tried also writing in college and I had some of my works, I submitted some of my work to uh, the small college, like literacy magazine. But after that, it kind of was left to fester, it was kind of left behind. I became overwhelmed with a lot of things and forgot how much I enjoyed writing and especially writing, <laughs> like writing for people that not necessarily just knew, but writing for people that I knew would kind of enjoy it. And I guess that like, I kind of always knew that I wanted to be a writer, but I haven't always been good with the practice. And I think having, starting with that community was what gave me the like kick to make writing be more important mm. yeah yeah I so when you first started looking and and like you said it was almost like a looking for the right social connection were you actively writing at the time or it was literally just oh that's right I used to love doing that maybe that's something I should start doing. Like it was part of finding community was to bring it back into your life. Part of finding the community was to put it back into my life. Mm. And like, cause I had ideas. I had ideas always running. Yeah. Like this would be a good story. Like I would just like ideas would come to me all the time, but they were not ever being put down on paper maybe i'd get like two like maybe a page and then forgotten i think there's something so important uh, that you said there and i and i'm trying to remember who had mentioned this maybe it was uh when i spoke to jackie but that idea of having readers and like you said similarly when i was in high school i would write long things notes and everything and just fun little stories to my friends and I was writing all the time to them but did I give time to write for myself like it wasn't important enough for me to write things down and then that um and then then you lose your way right if you don't sort of make it uh a priority for yourself or feel like it's not enough that you want that story in the world that is another really great service that writing community can provide. I think that's where um, the popularity of of sites like Wattpad come in. You know, these are young writers or even uh, flash fiction, uh, not flash fiction, fan fiction. Fanfiction.net. I actually did write a few fan fiction. There you go. Um, I did write, um, those I did write went independently. Can I I ask for what fandom? Um, no, on oh. no, I'm sorry, I'm, just, I'm too embarrassed, Ple- honestly. Pleading the fifth, oh no, I the fifth, it's so honestly. funny. I, you are not the first person. I find that a lot of times when you talk to fan fiction writers, they're like, I won't tell you. Sophia was like that. Sophia basically made a writing career out of her fan fiction, but would not tell me what she was writing fan fiction for, which I thought was hilarious. I was like, why can't I know? I won't judge, <laughs> but I get it. I totally get it. No, I, I judge, I judge, um, 20 something year old me very harshly. <laughs> I just, <laughs> um, you're the judge. <laughs> and it was, but it was basically like these one-off chapters. They were very angsty little pieces just like, yeah. and like, it was like problems with things like like places like fanfiction.net and mm. I even wrote a few um works that ended up on StoryNet, which is like the sister site of fanfiction.net that was for your original work original works the problem with them was nobody would really like write reviews mm. Like you maybe get one or two people like, oh, this is it's good. Such a, there's it. such dense sites, right? There's so much going on there. Right. How do you get found? How, how do people even see your stuff? Yeah. And like, and 
you're, if you don't get like that instant reply within like the first few days, it's, it's pretty much, if it's a popular fandom, it gets buried very quickly. And most people are, and maybe this is just like, like what I was writing was probably like not the happiest pieces. So I get why people weren't exactly like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Like, oh, this, like, I definitely get like, like reading and just kind of like dust testing and leaving. And, but I thought at the time, like, oh, maybe this is just means I'm a bad writer. Mm. Um, and I tried joining a RPG to try to do writing that way. Cool. This was before the writing group. And yeah. Um, the problem was making the connection with people to actually role play with people. Like, cause I knew right. a few people in the RPG, but I felt like, like I was trying to be very silly and funny. And I guess it wasn't that funny at the time because <laughs> I really did not attract that many it people. Wasn't, I wasn't landing. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't landing. Um, so it wasn't like, it, it's not like the, the meetups were like my first attempt at trying to find a writing community. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. I'm loving this to to hear how hard you worked at this that you weren't giving up on this aspect of yourself and that you just kept trying. You said that didn't work, but I'm going to show up again. I'm going to find yeah. something here. So that's that's incredible, Savvy. I mean, and, and it's weird because I just told you I wasn't writing before, but I guess I was. You were just, trying, yeah. You never I, gave up. I just like was going periods without writing and mm. it just felt like I guess I was very discouraged like yeah and, and I will say like that first group I didn't quite feel as comfortable with the one that wasn't led by Sophia the one that yes was yeah woman. um but and, and I'm trying to think about why I think it was because I was I think the problem was I was coming into a group that was always already very well established so people already had roles in that group yeah and, and i i will say with because i went to a couple of her meetings as well and for me if i remember correctly that was my first in-person writing group ever and she was very ready to self-publish what she was doing yeah and there was another guy there that had already worked in translation you know like he was doing translations of of um fairy tales of one I, I can't remember what country they were from but working in the publishing industry so these were people that were like already working as writers in my eyes and I was like oh I'm just here because I really like to write and I'm not sure how to do that for myself really almost to the same extent as, as you were saying it's like I will write if somebody's gonna read but I'm feeling weird about writing alone <laughs> <laughs> so so I can see that whereas when when Sophia's group started Sophia was uh in college at the time studying creative writing so she was a student of writing and very much out there but the rest of us that sort of gathered around were very similar in our um level of where we were at with the yeah. in our writing like we were all sort of like we love writing we want to do it how do we do it do we do it here <laughs> yeah. this, this seems like a good spot <laughs> and it was it, everybody was kind of like getting to know each other in the beginning like everybody was mm -hmm. there wasn't like like it took like maybe like three or four years before we had like a really set group of people because there was different people at different times a lot of rotation really yeah like, like um you never really felt like you were coming into an entrenched group that you were an outsider mm -hmm. and like there was always like in, in the way it was formatted there was always something that you could add right yeah 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 and yeah and it was true that we were kind of like everybody was all over the place like some per some people were like like Sophia was a she was going into creative writing professionally and other people were just working on trying to finish a first novel for like a self-publishing thing other people right. like um there was other people were editors and selling stories but there was also a lot of other people who were just doing it because it was something they enjoyed and hope right hoping to get to that point of writing that 
one novel. Yeah. Like n- nobody was like there to capitalize on the time. Like it wasn't like, right. Like, oh, we're going to focus on my story today. It was like, okay, so like we can take 15 minutes each of sharing. And it was divided very democratically, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was funny because we say no one capitalized the time. That's because we would take full days. <laughs> it would be like Sunday. This is all we're going to do now. It was like yeah. very, very long day, but it was wonderful. It was uh, so was, much fun. It was a lot of fun, even though um, one of the places we went to, I think, was the smoothie place. And every time like we were doing like critiques, we would read each other's, we would read, we'd have read each other's work and we were just like, had like 15, 20 minutes to just like discuss what we saw in the work. And every time I felt like I opened my mouth to talk, just like rushing ice. Yes. Rushing ice. Yes. Can we please go to a place that doesn't crush ice when we're reading? <laughs> Yeah. And we also got into a pretty bad habit of shutting down some places in Staten Island. It's like every venue we picked ended up needing to be shut down at one point or another. <laughs> yes. And for all the smoothies they were blending, they did end up shut down. And it's I, amazing. I, I guess the I know, smoothies are not doing it. Like Something going wrong. We did purchase things. We tried to help them. <laughs> yes. So in all of these processes between the Staten Island Writers Group, between Stop Writing Alone and the Happy Campers Club, what is it, aside from you now showing up for your writing, what is it that writing community has sort of done for you? How has it served you um, in your in your process and, and as a person, really? I, I think one of the nice things Um, at least with the writing communities uh, that I've been in with you, Nicole, is that everyone is very positive to see each other grow. Like, it's not like, like I am not the type of person who just wants blank praise. If you give me blank praise when I feel like I'm doing crappy, I will be cursing you out inside my head. (laughs) Like, I've been in like exercise classes and like, oh, you're doing so well. And I'm like, F you, I know I'm doing terrible. Stop <laughs> mocking me. Do you see me laying on the floor? Do you see me? I've fallen. <laughs> yeah. Don't mock me. I know, like, but it doesn't feel like empty praise. People are willing to be critical, but they're doing it, they do it in such a way as it's never nitpicky. It's in a way that they're genuinely trying to help you. Mm-hmm. Everyone is generally there to grow from each other and it's a very aspirational in some ways because like don't give me blank criticism don't give me blank praise Mm. if you can tell me what I am what I can do better and you can tell me what I'm doing really well and you could tell me that in the same sentence that makes me feel like I have the capacity for growth Mm. and that I have some skill of some sort that there is, I have the ability, I just need to apply it. And being with people like writing, (laughs) writing is fun, but it's such a chore. And like being with other writers, it's like a relief to hear them like kind of say the same thing. (laughs) Like they're just like some days they're so excited about writing and other days they're like, oh God, I have to go back. (laughs) (laughs) And it, it helps me like, put things in perspective. I'm not the only one feeling this way. Right. Yeah. I think that was one of the things that really helped me feel like I could say that I am a writer before I even uh, joined the, the Staten Island writers group. I had been blogging similar to you. I think seeking a space where I knew someone was reading what I was writing. Like, I will write if someone's going to read it. Oh, there's this thing called blogging. And if I write, people are showing up to read it. So that's how I got onto Twitter, just trying to like promote the blog and connect with other bloggers. And I got into some writing chats and would see other writers talking about exactly like you're saying, the day-to-day struggles of writing. And as soon as I saw other writers writing that, I was real, I realized, oh, it's not hard for me because I'm quote unquote, not a writer. 
it's hard because writing can be difficult. And so if I'm feeling the struggle, I'm doing it right. I'm a writer. I can't believe it. I didn't, I didn't realize it. I thought, you know, at some point it would be super easy. And that's when I could call myself a writer. So I, I agree with you. I think there's something so important about those conversations, wherever they're happening. And that, that sense of understanding that that's, uh, that's a part of it. And yeah, the, of course, the conversations where, where growth can happen, that's when it's really, really powerful. So I, I love that, um, that you've been feeling that and, and, uh, and getting that kind of um, response from, from working in the communities. So I don't think I gave you an opportunity in the beginning to let people know what it is that you do write or what you've been trying to write. Do you want to... Uh, what I'm currently writing um, is a fantasy novel. Um, I, I say it's a young adult, but I kind of would feel like young adult, like high school to like college age, I would say. Like So that's like that young adult to, uh, I always want to say new age and that's not it, new adult. New adult is a, a, a category that I've often heard of the college, I the college age kid, I guess. So it, it's fantasy, it relies very heavily on comedy. Um, I wanna say like one of my, like the type of comedy um, that inspires me is really uh, Sir Terry Pratchett, who's of course passed, but like his Dis Discworld series is very hilarious and very, um, very on the point. Mm. So, it is in part inspired by that, at least I, and it's been taking me some time to get into writing it, um, but it is what I turn to when I write to, when I write with the group. Okay. And yeah. And it's, it's gotten longer than anything else that I've written, but it's still some ways to go before it's done. Right. Right. And what would you say at this point is your sort of aspiration for your writing and writing career because I know you you have a career right now so writing is kind of like on the in-betweens of the day job so is your your dream to to just give this story in this book the time it needs and someday publish it or are you at the point of writing it for your own uh, enjoyment or is that just sort of like not not even in the I, I conversation think it's, yet? I think it's in I think it's like kind of in between. It's kind of like nebulous. Mm. It's the idea that I want to finish. Yeah. I want to finish it. And I always thought like, oh, it's gotta be the right book. But it doesn't have to be the right book. Mm. Because no book is the right book the first time you write it. And, th and that's something I'm realizing. Right. Because the first time you write it, it's this rough draft. of, And very few authors can get away with just publishing a rough draft. Right. The ones I don't know that, anyone. <laughs> I don't know anyone. <laughs> like there's, I think there's a couple, but most just go through it over and over again. And I, that's like, I shouldn't say most, but there's quite a few that go over it over and over. Mm. And I'm trying to let go of perfect. I'm trying mm. to get to done, at least for my first draft. Yeah. The first draft should just be the laying of the bones. But my problem is I feel like, like I tend to go backwards and I tend to edit and I tend to add. And that's where I need to stop because in doing that while in the middle of writing, I think that kind of messes up the flow of what writing, like what I'm trying to write in the future. Like mm. you get fixed in what's happening in the past and you have to focus on what's going to happen next. Yeah. And, and, try, and that's where like advice from like other writers, like Jackie, um, like just to throw something crazy and see what happens next. Right. And that's where I'm at right now. Mm. figuring out something crazy to throw next because I I know where the ending is going to take me I feel like this could be like a multi-work series but I don't want to necessarily 
leave it too much of a cliffhanger. -y. I don't right. want to leave it in a cliffhanger thing. I want to leave it with the possibility of it to be continued. Whether yeah. or not it isn't, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I think getting to a finish line of a story of a draft is so important. And that's that's why I gave myself that uh, 52 short stories and 52 weeks project because I wasn't I wasn't in the same struggle as you. I I released the revising while writing because that was getting me nowhere. But I still was struggling with allowing myself to finish. So I was like, let me just do short stories where I have and let me practice ending practice beginning middle end practice beginning middle end um because the only way i could do 52 stories in 52 weeks is to do the messy to do them imperfect to just finish 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 and then i have all this work now that i can revise and rewrite and and give each one its time so um and could yeah I comment on that nicole because I, I have to say like I, your writing has really grown yeah, I think you are in a position to see that Nancy, who I've interviewed before, who's in the writing group with us, uh, you two ladies are probably the only people, uh, aside from like family and everything that are in my life that could really attest to that besides me, I opened up files on my computer. And I'm like, Oh, how freaking adorable was I, you know, <laughs> like there, I do see it. Um, in in certain spaces but i thank you because i i wonder if i'm just feeling proud of whatever i've accomplished little things but i i can see a difference myself and i do think um that not only you know clearly i see a difference from when we first started writing groups in staten island writing groups i have those files on my computer to now but in the last like five to 10 years with really doing writing prompt parties a lot and doing the 52 short stories, I can see so much change in this short amount of time. So I think yeah. there's a lot to giving ourselves those challenges of finishing and then revising, you know, and, and really working on stories and it only happens when we release the perfection of that first draft i was very much in that same mindset as you that i believed it had to come out of my pen perfectly on that first time and again it, it was tied into that definition of me being a writer that if i couldn't do that then i wasn't a writer and and i really do you know me we're both teacher souls here, right? Like I love me the education system, but I do feel like it failed me in my in my writer soul because there was not really an emphasis on revision for me in school. It was no. write this thing, have it in tomorrow, and it will be graded. And that was that, you know, it wasn't like write it. I had maybe one one or two teachers that talked about the revision process, but I did not understand what they were saying because every other teacher wanted stuff done in one draft. So I was like, I don't, this seems like a waste of time. So um, yeah, that was a hard lesson to learn. A very hard lesson to learn. And that wasn't something I necessarily learned. Like I was like, you were in Catholic school, I was in public school. And I guess maybe that yeah. was the time period that we were growing into. Like, I don't teach, um, I don't teach general at high school, so I don't see how um, I I don't like I'm not in the day to day processes. But when my sister was going mm. to high school, which was about several years ago, right, um, several years after me, <laughs> they were starting to do that more. They were starting to do that right. process more. The problem was it was very much focused on nonfiction and doing essays right. and, there's a, and then and there's a great aspect to that because I have written letters I have done nonfiction writing too like yeah that's definitely when I'm impassioned about something I'm writing on my Facebook wall right um, a little Same. bit like longer than like what is normal for people right <laughs> um but um there is value to nonfiction but I think um the emphasis on nonfiction at times um, denies like the importance of fiction. Like I remember mm. reading somewhere that fiction teaches us empathy. It yeah. helps us understand a perspective that is not our own. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a huge yeah. study. And I, and I, I think that's, I mean, that's, that's something that I talk about on, on the podcast frequently, because I just also want authors to understand and writers to understand the incredible importance of showing up for your work, because it sometimes feels like it's frivolous or what have you, yeah. which is uh, to me, that's that when I first read that study, I think I was, I think I was either blogging or just starting Stop Writing Alone. I don't remember when the study came out, but I remember the study coming out at, a, at almost precisely the time that the New York City uh, public school curriculum was saying, we need to emphasize nonfiction in the classrooms. And my, my husband had to start teaching more nonfiction. I was like, no, look at this study. It's all about how fiction builds empathy. And that's what the world needs now. And, and that really is like the, my, my clarion call here to all writers that I think there's something when we write fiction, there are times that we get lost in thinking that maybe it's a frivolous endeavor and, oh, there's more quote unquote important things to do with our time. And we should be serious, especially if we talk to people that are not writers who have, you know, other careers or what have you. To me, that study, that understanding that fiction builds empathy um, raises the, the art and profession of writing to a level of such great importance that it's, if you have a calling to do it, I feel like you need to show up to the page to help build that in our world. I mean, what more do we need? So, um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. Nonfiction, you know, we need nonfiction without question, but the lack of emphasis on fiction is, it can be frightening <laughs> when we realize that that's where we get our empathy from. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I do want to ask you, there's one question that I've been asking everybody that I've been interviewing. I, you know, I'm always about us writing together and stop writing alone, but is there a part of your process when you're doing writing where you need to be alone, where you need to sort of like shut the door and and be with yourself and your writing to get it done? Or are you the opposite that it's only getting done and you're only truly showing up if you're in community? As much as I'm an introvert, I find that I write more when I'm in the community. Amazing, amazing, I love it. I, I left the community for a while. I got overwhelmed with work and I was like three to four years and mm -hmm. I barely touched my writing. Right. I was still thinking of stories, but I'm like, oh, I don't have time. Right. Or I'd be distracted by something else. It's very easy to, to then to just veg out and ingest other people's work mm. and not really focus on your own. Right. And I want to kick myself because I think in those years that I wasn't active, I lost an opportunity to grow. And like coming back and like, again, seeing how much you have grown and like reading some of your stories. And I'm like, oh my God, this looks published. And I'm like, oh shit, I like, I've like, how much have I grown? I have not grown that much. I have not been as dedicated as this to call. Um, and but on the flip side, you've been in the classroom working your butt off where I have not, you know, how many other students and souls have grown uh, in complete gratitude to you showing up for them. So, you know, we have wildly different schedules and, and responsibilities too, that have allowed me to show up in a way that, you know, that it was unavailable to me when I was teaching for sure. I mean, even when I have the summers off, I feel like I don't have that self, this, that's, I have my periods of self-motivation are few and far between to devote to those things that I do enjoy. Right, right. But it is a, it is definitely work too. Yeah. Yeah. I I I I've said it over and over again here, but part of the the um the motivation for me to create all of this is the recognition that it's easier for me to show up for others than just for myself. So it's like, oh if I say I'm gonna have a podcast every week 
then um, I have to show up for it because of that one person that I know listens, you know, <laughs> and if I say I'm going to show up to a write-in, I have to show up in case somebody else is there. But if I say I'm going to go write on Wednesday or Thursday, like I'm not important enough. It's, it's definitely a self-esteem yeah. thing for me and uh, a self-love thing that I've been working on for years. And this is like a, a workaround, <laughs> you know, a little fix while I work on that. But I totally get it. I mean, never mind that the the art and active teaching is exhausting. So it's it's you do need the summers to rebuild all of that was um, given out in the year before. So I, I would be kind to yourself about all of that because I did not write like this when I was teaching. I couldn't. I left it all on the classroom floor all of it and just tried to build something back up on every day off and every school vacation. Um, I did a lot of like read, like you're saying, consuming of story on my vacations to sort of just build back all of that creativity that uh, in the end ended up going back to my students. Um, and it was only after the, the classroom and the teaching was taken out of my life that I was like, what do I do with all this creative energy now? <laughs> you know, and that's, that's given me, this is my other sort of outlet. But if I were still teaching, I don't know that I would be able to show up for my writing in the, in the way that I have. So I totally get it. I absolutely get it so much. Um, you're, you are being creative every single day that you um, make another lesson and, and, and problem solve how to reach a student and how to assess a student. All of that is your writing. Uh, you know, it's only in hindsight that I can see that now about my own career, because I, I had those thoughts. I'm like 10 years, really, I didn't really write. But when I think about the things that I did in and around the classroom, I'm like, but you were creating nonstop, Nicole. So Sevi, that's, that's absolutely, I'm sure where you're, where it's all going and it makes so much sense. I love that you are still showing up though for your writing in between that in whatever way that you can, because that's above and beyond anything that, that I ever did. Have you ever considered creating your own writing community and all that time that you were searching and one community didn't work and then another one and then another one. Did you ever think I will find my people and, and make this happen? I think for me, I know my skills. I know I can direct students. <laughs> right, I right. know uh, I work well with spe- children with special needs on the autism spectrum or multiple right. people. I know how to uh, engage them in the classroom but you take away that familiar structure for me and you expect me to handle adults and adults conversations and (laughs) trying to like uh not your jam not it's not it's it's (laughs) definitely not my jam it's definitely not like it's definitely not one of my strengths right right like I I think I try to like organize a weekly write-in with just people I already knew and I was like hi guys and then I was like oh shit what do I say next like, like, <laughs> so you're here and I'm here and great yeah <laughs> yeah I know I get it and that's it it's not it is not for everyone even though it is available to everyone and and I think knowing our strengths is great and like I said I, I I'm just so impressed at how you've shown up for yourself in continuing to seek it out like I'm not going to create it but I know that if this didn't fit, maybe this will. And then that doesn't fit, maybe this will. Uh, I think that takes a, a certain level of, of endurance that maybe not everybody devotes to their own personal growth and their creativity. So that's to be commended. I think that's amazing. So I have one last question for you okay. that I have been asking everybody also. Sebi, if you yeah. had to define the term writing community. What is writing community to you? It's a place where people who write or appreciate the craft of writing come together, encourage each other, and try to help each other become stronger in their craft through respect and through 
mutual, like, not discipline, but mutual support. I don't know if that makes sense for me. No, that's great. I, it's funny because I was just listening. I didn't finish, but I was listening to uh, an, a podcast episode of uh, Brene Brown's. And she was talking to the authors of, oh goodness, now I can't remember the name of the book, but it's, a, it's all around friendship. And they brought up the term discipline. And they were like, there's so much um, almost negative connotations to this word of discipline that we have, but really it's showing up, right? If we think about it as showing up for ourselves and showing up for our friendship and our relationship, like that's what we mean when we say discipline. So I think it's really interesting that you use that word, but you were like, not dis- not discipline support. But I think it is kind of in that that realm of, what is discipline really? It's showing up for each other, showing up to our writing, showing up for support. Um, yeah. No, I think that was great, great definition. Awesome. Love it. Love it. So Sevi, anything else that you want to share with the uh, Stop Writing Alone community while you have their ear? Just um, Nicole is an awesome person and you should definitely check out her podcasts and her community. And I think um, I think anyone would be blessed to have someone like her leading her, their writing communities. Oh my goodness, Sevi, you are ridiculous. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I am awesome because of the people that are around me. So I thank you for, for being there for all these years which is a really really long time it's bananas when we think about it <laughs> I, I, I think Sophia's may have been like 2011 2010 2011 it makes sense because it's it's definitely before my son was born because you guys were there through my whole crazy pregnancy and everything so yeah that's I mean that's a decade at least uh, at <laughs> least that we've been in each other's lives it's it's wonderful Ah, uh, Sevi, thank you so much for spending the time with me today. And thank you for all of your support through all of these years. Um, yeah, I, I can't thank you enough. This was really, really great. It was good talking to you. Bye. Bye. Well, I enjoyed that. And I hope that was um, enjoyable for you as well. I love talking to writers who are at all different stages of getting to publication, already published, or um, fitting in writing around life, not being the person that says, I've always wanted to write a book. I guess I'll start it someday when I retire, but instead just taking taking the time when you can, however you can, to show up for this thing that uh, that lights you up. And that's, that's Sevi to a T. I, I as I said during the interview, I admire her so much because she's doing what I know I needed to do for myself back when I was teaching. Um, but I couldn't see it then. I couldn't see the importance of making sure that I was uh, getting to the page uh, outside of my classroom. So anyway, it was a, a great conversation for me. Really enjoyable going through all of these interviews as I'm uh, revising the Stop Writing Alone book. Uh, But I just want to say for anybody that listens to the podcast in real time, like every Thursday morning when it comes out, I do want to apologize for uh, not showing up last week. I'm not sure I mentioned it here on the podcast, but um, we had in our home experience two floods in in the last month. Uh, And one was was pretty well... um, covered in the news with the the remnants of that storm Ida and just as I was getting ready to produce last week's episode FEMA showed up at my door and was going through the whole process of uh, filing um, all of the damages that happened and I was going to push it and stay up and um, really just get the episode out anyway But then I remembered all of the advice that I give to writers all the time about, you know, sometimes it just doesn't happen and that's okay. You got to take care of yourself. You got to make sure um, that that you are 100 percent for whatever your creative endeavor is. And so for once in my life, I took my own advice Um, 
And that was why there was a little bit of a a quiet space in last week unannounced. Uh, I will say, though, that some other creation bubbled to the surface, and that is the creation of my brand new Substack coming soon called Story Hoarder. In a conversation with the Happy Campers, I believe it was on Friday night, it was brought to my attention that I, in fact, am a little bit of a story hoarder, that some people are very well versed in what my writing is like, Sevi being a perfect example who I just interviewed because she's been reading my writing for years, but the world at large really hasn't been exposed to my writing in any way. Um, So uh, as the conversation came up, I was like, yeah, yeah, I guess I'm a bit of a story hoarder. And everyone that was in the call (laughs) sort of froze and was like, wait, that's brilliant. (laughs) That story hoarder idea. And we looked it up at storyhoarder.com was available and story hoarder Substack was available. So um, I am the proud owner of storyhoarder.com. But more importantly, have started uh, the process of creating a, a story hoarder substack where I will be sharing all of the stories that I have been writing all of these years through uh, the 52 stories in 52 weeks, the writing prompt parties that I do, the uh, NYC Midnight Contest that I have participated in. I just have all of these stories all over the place. Uh, You know, stories that I write for just the heck of it. Um, But it is about time that the world gets to see Nicole Rivera's writing in a real way. So that is where I'm going to start rolling it out. And I will put a link in the uh, show notes. If you want to be one of the first followers to storyhoarder.substack.com, I believe I will be putting out my first post that sort of just explains um, what Story Hoarder is and where it comes from. Uh, And then probably... uh, next week or perhaps a week after next week is a holiday I may I may be taking off for Thanksgiving Um, but in in a couple of weeks there will be some fiction coming your way if you subscribe to storyhoarder.substack.com and uh, that is it for this week I mean it's been a busy week but I'm gonna not bore you with all the details I am going to let you get back to your writing, especially if you are participating in NaNoWriMo. Go get those words in. You have a little over a week left. And um, remember that whatever it is that you get done in this month, however many words, as long as it's over zero, if you've written anything this month, you are already a winner. So just keep it up and keep on going. Be positive all the way through and happy writing. Thank you as always for listening and I will talk to you next week.